Uh, it's a pleasure to be in this room where um, I have both participated in and, and hosted many wonderful book events about French writers uh, with them in some cases. Uh, and it's wonderful to have with me Laird and Ben, um, like myself, great lovers of Flaubert and Francophones. Uh, each of us will have a different story to tell about our relationship with Flaubert, and especially the relationship with the letters. Um, just a few words of my own to begin with. First, the letters, the, the first volume, the first letter in the volume, this wonderful uh, New York Review of Books collection, which is selected translated and edited by Francis Diegmuller, who devoted his life to Flaubert. Uh, and the first letter was written in 1831 when Flaubert was 10. And um, to his childhood friend, Ernest Chevalier, the last letter is dated May 3rd, 1880, to Guy de Maupassant, five days before his death at 59. So this is a lifetime. This is, in fact, um, you could say this is his education sentimentale. This is his sentimental education, documented year by year, in some ways, week by week. Uh, it's the the, the self-invention of the writer. It's the uh, and it, it's. A, well, we'll talk more about this. But it's a book that, in some ways, has the spontaneity that Flaubert forbade himself to uh, indulge in his writing. If I had been able to give this evening a title, I would have taken it from the letters, and that would be Desire Keeps One Alive. So I think we'll, I'll ask my friends to begin by saying a little bit about their relationship to Flaubert and to his, to the letters in particular, but to Flaubert in general. Do you want to start, Laird? Sure, glad to. Um, it's great to be here with with you and with with all of you as well. Um, what a what a thrill to talk about um, Gustav. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I have to confess that that's um, how I came to think of him really, really early in my engagement with, with Flaubert, uh, was as Gustave, um, as a kind of um, older, uh, uh, not, not quite an older brother figure, but, an, but a sort of uncle uh, figure um, uh, in, in my naivete. That's how I saw it um, when I first encountered uh, his work as a student at the University of Strasbourg in the 1980s. Um, and uh, read Madame Bovary. That, that was my point of first contact, probably was for a lot of us in the room. Um, and uh, thought that here was something extraordinary and had no way to metabolize it, was not prepared at all um, to, to, um, uh, to, to do anything, as it were, with it. A few years later, um, uh, though, it was um, l'éducation sentimentale uh, was my next point of serious contact with uh, the person I stopped calling Gustave internally and thought of as Monsieur Flaubert once I had read uh, um, A Sentimental Education. Um, and uh, uh, had um, really um, all sorts of, um, I, you know, from a pictures of oneself as a kind of a switchboard. All, all the switches were thrown, um, a fuse box, I suppose. They were all turned on, um, reading uh, that book. Um, uh, and reading it in the company um, of uh, uh, the extraordinary Proust scholar, uh, Jean-Yves Tadier. I was doing, uh, I was being an unsuccessful student at Paris 4 at the Sorbonne. Um, and um, this was on the docket, as was uh, Michel de Montaigne, another extraordinary, for me, discoveries. Um, and it was as if uh, I, uh, my, my world had, had been turned upside down and exploded um, by this, uh, uh, especially by this contact with Flaubert. However, the, fo the, the third uh, stop was the conclusive one for me in terms of finding a way to do something with um, this person who, who sort of gained in, in eminence for me um, the, 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 the more I went along with it and, and the more I realized the distance between me um, and, and this, this titanic individual. Um, I was uh, uh, at um, the poet Bernadette Mayer's apartment in the late 90s trying to be a young writer in New York, uh, and there on her shelf was a copy of uh, Three Tales in the, in the, the New Directions, I, I guess, edition. Um, and she, she allowed me to, to take it home and to read A Simple Heart. Um, and that was 
um, when it all sort of came into a, a sense of possibility uh, for me was that encounter with Felicite um, and that later became um, the great inspiration for my own um, efforts uh, in, in Zori. Um, so it was a long-standing affair. And, and, and you know, I, maybe I've come back around this evening to, to thinking of him as Gustave, um, partly because his name comes up so much in these extraordinary letters that are the real focus of what we're going to be talking about tonight and all that um, amazing humanity that comes rushing at you when you engage with these um, really um, extraordinary uh, um, works of a sort of intellectual, an intellectual gesture, and then all of the emotion um, that's, that's readily available and that he didn't allow himself, let's be honest, in so much of the work that really made his name. Um, I just wanted to ask you to follow up with that. I know that Zori, that a simple heart is, is a sort of um, anima for Zori. And uh, it, it, it was written in a way, in, it was written as an homage to Georges Sand, uh, who was the great friend of her old. It, they, she was t 20 some odd years older than he was. They had, a, uh, they had an amitié amoureux, which it, it was, she was a motherly figure to him. They had extraordinarily frank and open and uh, mutually loving relationship, epistolary relationship. We will read a couple of their letters, or at least one tonight. Uh, and she was always telling him, she was basically telling him, why do you have to be so gloomy? Why do you have to be such a, a misanthropist? Why can't you write something uplifting? And, um, and he would always answer back very sternly because I don't want to write, I didn't want to write uplifting things. He didn't see the world that way. But in A Simple Heart, he, uh, he, um, he makes a virtue out of love, but he refuses to, to derive a moral from it. And that was as far as he would go. But he, it really was an uh, homage de son. Uh, to the person he, he, he writes to a cher maître, right? Right. Um, and uh, a kind of homage and acknowledgement um, as well. But no, it, it was um, uh, really, for me, um, having read it through three or four or five times, I mean, I teach it. It's, it's, I, I teach a simple heart, um, so it stays very, very mm -hmm. alive to me. But it was the extraordinary simplicity and elegance of the structure um, that uh, allowed me to find my way in. Right, you start near the end of someone's life, and then you go all the way back to the beginning, march it forward chronologically, catch where you started, go a little bit farther, and that's it. And so it forms this lovely sort of looping shape. Um, and so that was what allowed me to see my way into this life of, a, of, this, uh, of this, this woman in, in rural Indiana who has nothing in many ways to do with Felicite and her life uh, in Normandy. Um, thank you. Ben, so tell us uh, how did the, your Flaubert Odyssey begin? And well, the best thing that happened to me in college was studying French language and literature. Uh, it was life changing. And I too was at the University of Strasbourg in the, in the, the summer of 72. Then in the fall of 72, uh, I was at Haverford College, but I went over to Bryn Mawr to study uh, intermediate French literature and uh, uh, had a marvelous teacher named Michel Guggenheim who assigned <coughs> Madame Bovary. And I found my, the book became my constant companion and I began it not really knowing how to read French, uh, pretending I was reading French, but I ended it with a, uh, with a working knowledge and it was all on account of this marvelous lexical range and range of, in point of view and uh, all the resources of the modern novel are suddenly in place uh, and uh, there is a uh, a time before Flaubert in the history of the novel and a time after Flaubert, but he is the midpoint, uh, the most axial figure in the history of the novel. Uh, I found a passage from uh, James Wood's book, How to Read Fiction. No, that's not the title of it. Suddenly I can't remember the title of the How book. How Fiction Works. How Fiction Works, that's it, thank you. Uh, he says in How Fiction Works, Novelist should thank Flaubert the way poets thank spring. It all begins again with him. There really is a time before Flaubert and a time after him. 
Flaubert decisively established what most readers and writers think of as modern realist narration. And his influence is almost too familiar to be visible. We hardly remark of good prose that it favors the telling and brilliant detail, that it privileges a high degree of visual noticing, that it maintains an unsentimental composure and knows how to withdraw like a good valet from superfluous commentary, that it judges good and bad neutrally, that it seeks out the truth even at the cost of repelling us, and that the author's fingerprints are on all this are paradoxically traceable but not visible. You can find some of this in Defoe or Austin or Balzac, but not all of it until Flaubert. Um, and so that's, I thank uh, Professor Michel Guggenheim with all my heart for the, the introduction by way of Madame Bovary to the universe of the novel uh, which Flaubert bestrides. Um, Ben is, has written a wonderful uh, biography of Proust, and um, and Proust uh, wrote. I, I I'll tell you about my introduction to Flaubert in a minute. But I read this in, uh, Education Sentimentale in 1971. I was going to bring the paperback because I reread it every few years in the same now crumbling paperback with my French boyfriend on a trip by Greyhound bus from New York City to Mexico City, and it was 78 hours. And um, I read the, the whole book, wrapped. I didn't see where I was. I didn't look up from the pages. I, we had to get off at Dallas probably to pee. Uh, and Dallas was deserted in 1971 in the summer. Downtown Dallas, nothing. And at the border, there was a Flaubertian moment. By then, I had gotten to the end of the book. And I, 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 I was, it was this terrible parting. I couldn't, some books you cannot bear. You know you only have 50 pages left, and you're, you're looking around desperately. There was a young man on the bus with us from Luxembourg. We got to the border, the American border, with Mexico. And the customs officials looked at his passport and they said, never heard of it. And he didn't speak a word of English. And so he said, what, what does he mean? I said, they said that he's never heard of Luxembourg. And it was such a Flaubert moment, the, 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 the sort of the village, um, you know, the, the incredibly provincial guy from South Texas looking at a foreign passport from a country he's never heard of. Um, but there's a, I wanted to read you uh, from that book, uh, uh, Proust writing in the introduction exactly about what Ben was saying uh, about the before and after of Flaubert and French literature. He, Proust in his very Proustian sort of uh, slightly prissy, wonderfully prissy way, fixes on the tenses that Flaubert uses and he fixes upon the imperfect, which is sort of a fabulous irony in talking about Flaubert, his love of the imperfect. Uh, and he says, it, meaning um, disparaisser, contempler, disé, uh, which is the unfinished past. Uh, it's, it's what can't be finished. It's also what continues from the past to the present and goes on into the future. It's, it's a timeline. And he says, um, the, this imperfect, so novel in literature, entirely changes the aspect of things and beings as does a lamp that one exchanges for an old one, almost empty, when one moves into a new house. That is the nature of the sadness, a product of broken habits and the unreality of the decor that makes Flaubert's style. Which is a very strange, itself mysterious, haunted house kind of thing to say, uh, but, um, but uh, it, it somehow resonates with what you were saying. And I, I just want to say one more thing about, I read Madame Bovary at 17 in French. I was a French, mi I minored in French. And uh, I was smitten. It was, it was, it was really love. My, my hard drive was called Gustave, the original hard drive. Hard drive and, and Flaubert, that's also good. I've only realized tonight the, the irony of that. Um, but, and the, the much vaunted impersonality of Flaubert's writing, it's not true. And I discovered this. It was like the moment when somebody you love reveals something about themselves. And I memorized these lines so I could carry them with me. And I've carried them with me. I'm now 77. I was 17. So anyone who can do the math, which is not me. Uh, it's a lot of years. Um, comme si la plénitude de l'âme. I could do this by heart, but I'm not going to do that. Comme si la plénitude de l'âme ne débordait pas quelquefois dans les métaphores les plus vides. 
puisque personne jamais ne peut donner l'exacte mesure de ses, de ses douleurs, de, de ses conceptions ni de ses douleurs, et que la parole humaine, excuse-moi, l'exacte mesure de ses besoins, ni de ses conceptions, ni de ses douleurs, et que la parole humaine est comme un chaudron follet où nous battons des mélodies à faire danser les ours quand on voudrait attendrir les étoiles. And many of you will know what that means, but he says, he, he steps away from the narrative. Um, Emma and Rodolphe have gone off to have a tryst in the country, and Rodolphe is listening to Emma prattling, and he's a cynic, and he lights a cigar, and he thinks to himself how mediocre it is. And Flaubert is so moved by Emma's, Emma's predicament in this moment that he doesn't use the first person pronoun, but he does in that way, and he says, as if the soul's fullness didn't sometimes overflow into the emptiest of metaphors, for no one ever can give the exact measure of his needs, his apprehensions, or his sorrows. And human speech is like a cracked cauldron on which we bang out tunes that make bears dance when what we want to do is move the stars to pity. And if you don't fall in love with the person who wrote that. Um, so maybe, would you like to, to read us a letter? We'll start hearing the letters themselves. Oh, that sounds, yeah, let's, let's jump into these letters. Um, and, and I was, um, it, it, it occurred to me that it, it might be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them out of chronological order. I want to start with a letter to Turgenev, his, his great friend and friend to, to many of the French uh, uh, literati um, uh, uh, in, in, um, in this period. Um, and uh, partly because it, it gets at um, this Flaubert who is by turns sort of, you know, moaning and groaning and then also just thinking about literature, thinking about um, uh, the, the value of art. Um, and, and, seems like it's always swirling around. Um, so this is uh, uh, July 2nd, 1874, and um, it's written from Switzerland to Turgenev. I am hot too, and my condition is superior or inferior to yours in that I'm colossally bored. I came here as an act of obedience, having been told that the pure mountain air would unredden my face and calm my nerves. So be it, but so far, I'm aware only of immense boredom due to solitude and idleness. Besides, I'm no man of nature. Her wonders move me less than those of art. She overwhelms me without inspiring me with any great thoughts. I feel like telling her, all right, all right, I just left you. I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Leave me alone. I need some other kinds of amusement. Besides, the Alps are out of scale with our little selves. They're too big to be useful to us. This is the third time they have had a disagreeable effect on me. I hope it may be the last. And then my fellow vacationers, the honorable foreigners living in this hotel, all Germans or English, equipped with walking sticks and field glasses. Yesterday I was tempted to kiss three calves that I met in a meadow out of sheer humanity and a need to be demonstrative. My trip got off to a bad start. At Lucerne, I had a tooth extracted by one of the local artists. A week before leaving for Switzerland, I made a tour in the Orne Calvados, where I found the place to settle my two characters. I'm impatient to get started on this book, which terrifies me cruelly in advance. You mentioned St. Anthony saying it hasn't found favor with the general public. I knew in advance that this would be so, but I expected to be more widely understood by the elite. Had it not been for Drummond and Pelletin, I shouldn't have had a single favorable review, and yet I've seen none from Germany. But we're in God's hands. What's done is done. And as long as you like the book, I'm amply rewarded. Ben has something a little different in store. Yes, this is, this is a letter uh, from Croisier. Uh, uh, July 22nd, 1852, to his lover and student, Louise Collet. I am in the midst of copying and correcting with much scratching out all my first part of Bovary. My eyes are smarting. I should like to be able to read these 158 manuscript pages at a single glance and grasp them with all their details in a single thought. 
a week from Sunday, I shall reread the whole thing to Bouillé, uh, his friend Louis Bouillé. <coughs> and the next day, or the day after, you will see me. What a bitch of a thing prose is. It is never finished. There is always something to be done over. However, I think it can be given the consistency of verse. A good prose sentence should be like a good line of poetry, unchangeable, just as rhythmic, just as sonorous. Such, at least, is my ambition. One thing I am sure of, no one has ever conceived a more perfect type of prose than I. We, we need to talk a little bit about Louise Collet, I think. Um, many of you will know who she was. Louise Collet was 11 years older than Flaubert. She was a, um, a writer, a poet. Uh, poetry was, the, was the, the genre that she had the most ambition for. And she was very ambitious indeed. And she, uh, she, she, she aspired to la gloire, to fame. And Flaubert chided her unmercifully for this incredibly bourgeois and banal ambition. Um, and they met at an artist studio. Uh, she had, she was, if in in, sent, in Education Sentimentale, there's a character called Mademoiselle Vatnas, and she's she plays a minor role. She's a, a, a passionate woman living by her wits, a writer uh, who keeps a uh, keeps a young singer a man. Um, and is always short of money, and, and there are many many qualities of Louise. It's a, it, it's a she's a ferocious, slightly melancholy uh, melancholy figure, slightly pathetic figure, uh, as, as a woman of that uh, vulnerability would have been in in uh, 19th century. So Flaubert had been celibate when he met Louise for a long period of time. He falls upon her. He falls upon her, and they have passionate assignations. And he writes her some of the great love letters of all time. And then, and, 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 and they meet for, they, they meet in the railroad stations, the hotel for the tryst and here and there. And of course, then his lust is slaked and, um, and he, he writes her extraordinary letters about uh, his work. So the great letters about his work are, 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 are almost, all, most of them are to her. But she doesn't want to hear that. She wants to hear something else. She would like a baby, maybe. She would like to meet his mother, at the very least. And that's not going to happen. And so he gets cooler and cooler, and he says, well, what should I talk to you about if not Shakespeare? And then, um, and then he gets demonically, misogynistically, demonically cruel. So uh, Louise, and he has been cast as the Ted Hughes of the 19th century in relation to Louise. Uh, and there's um, uh, one, you will read the letters for yourself and make your own, come to your own conclusion about it, but certainly there's a, there's, um, a terrific amount of misogyny, not just Flaubert's misogyny, it was in the L'air du temps. Um, so the, this book is very rich, it, it has, it's really rich in the letters to, to Louise Collet. Uh, is there another one that somebody wanted to read? A letter to Louise? I, I, I have one more yes, to, to Louise um, that I could read. Let's see here. This is a short one. Um, and uh, very uh, close, to, close to my heart. This is, this is actually, it's excerpted from, from Letter to Louise Collet, but it, the original was short as well. Um, so this is uh, from Croisset. So we're, we're, um, at, we're at, at Flaubert's home, and it's September 20th, 1851. So he's, he's, um, he's starting Bovary. Ma chère amie, I leave for London next Thursday. Last night, I began my novel. Now I foresee difficulties of style, and they terrify me. It's no small thing to be simple. I kept that above my keyboard for a long time. It's no small thing to be simple. I'm afraid of becoming another Paul de Kock or producing a kind of Chateaubriandized Balzac. The worst. I have had a sore throat since my return. My vanity likes to think that this is not due to fatigue, and I think my vanity is right. And you? How are you? 
I am very busy at the moment on a temporary task I will tell you about later. Adieu, chère Louise. I kiss your white neck. A long kiss. Uh, it's just interesting also to remark about the, the um, reference to Chateaubriand because um, he he was he's cast himself as the great anti-romantic, and yet in he writing to Sainte Beuve, uh, he who was who was one of the rare critics actually who who gave Madame Bovary a, a positive review, and he was extremely grateful for it, even though he didn't really like Sainte Beuve's work much. He didn't say that in the letter. Um, Wait, he he says no. I he's what did he calls himself? This fantastic. A brutal romantic. No, it it, it it's um. Wait, it's definitely. Oh yes. He didn't admire Sandberg much, but he um. The Madame Bovary had been savaged by other critics, and he says. No, not at all. You, you misunderstand me. I'm a rabid old romantic or a fossilized one. Uh, and so in a way you can see his work as the, the, the dialectic in every life, in every writer's life, if, as a biographer, which you, it's your scaffold, you have to give it up. But for him it's between this romanticism and modernism and the, 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 the control and the, the uh, distance and the detachment and the, spo the spontaneity and the wildness and the indulgence and the romanticism of, of the, the generation be before his. Uh, so would you like to give us a taste of that? Because I know the letters that you read from Egypt. Oh. Well, yes, uh, uh, Siegmuller, who was a, a phenomenal scholar and editor, uh, produced also a book called Flaubert in Egypt, in which he uh, 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 mines uh, Flaubert's travel diaries and letters home. And the letters home are particularly interesting. Uh, he, uh, he writes letters home to his mother, which are uh, studious and goody-goody, to, to put it bluntly, and, and letters home to his uh, great friend, Louis Bouillet, who, um, which are extremely frank. Uh, so I'll give you first the letter home to Maman, and then after that to Louis. Hang on. Flaubert to his mother, written uh, en route uh, in his, the course of his voyage en Orient. We are leading a good life, my dear old darling. Oh, how sorry I am that you are not here. How you would love it if you knew what calm surrounds us and how peaceful are the depths we feel our minds explore. We laze, we loaf, we daydream. In the morning, I study Greek, read Homer. In the afternoon, I write. During the day, we often take our rifles and look for game. I'm going quite good, much to my amusement. Me, a good shot. You think me a bragging piece, uh, child when I tell you that last Saturday we killed 54 pieces of game, all doves or pigeons. Uh, meanwhile, he's writing to Louis Bouillet about a different sort of hunting. I have to uh, identify one word in this bardash, which some of you, a word some of you may know. Uh, it's, it, it means uh, a catamite or, or, or more broadly anyone homosexual, homosexual man, I mean. Speaking of bardashes, he writes to Louis Bouillet. This is what I know about them. Here it is quite accepted. One admits one's sodomy and it is spoken of at table in the hotel. Sometimes you do a bit of denying and then everybody teases you and you end up confessing, traveling as we are for educational purposes and charged with a mission by the government. We have considered it our duty to indulge in this form of ejaculation. So far, the occasion has not presented itself. We continue to seek it, however. 
It's at the baths that such things take place. You reserve the bath for yourself, five francs, including masseurs, pipe, coffee, sheet, and towel, and you skewer your lad in one of the rooms. Well, I'll let it go with that. You know. I think I'm going to read a different letter to his mother, because uh, it, Madame, Madame Flaubert has gotten sort of a short end of the biographical stick. Uh, and uh, the, lots is written about Flaubert's father, the great doctor, the great surgeon, about his brother, the other great surgeon, about his niece who bankrupted him, and about various other people in his life. His mother basically, um, well, he lived with her for his, his whole life until her death. She supported him. They were extremely close. At, he, he was inconsolable at her death. And, uh, and I think, uh, and the, he, he was uh, impossible to live with, there's no question about that. He had a, a little pavilion on the grounds of Quasse, which he called the screaming, the screaming House, where he would go and bellow and scream. And, um, but this is, a very, this is a letter that anybody with a son, um, and many people without sons, anybody with a man in his or her life will recognize a certain, a certain tone, adolescent tone, so there's 29. <laughs> Here, um, his friend uh, Ernest Chevalier is just um, getting married so, to his mother. December 15th, 1850. When is the wedding to be, you ask me, apropos of the news of Ernest Chevalier's marriage? When? Never, I hope. As far as man can answer for what he will do, I reply in the negative. Contact with the world, and I've been rubbing shoulders with it now for 14 month, months, makes me feel more and more like returning to my shell. Uncle Parrain, who claims that travel changes a man, is wrong as far as I'm concerned. And I set out, so shall I return, except that there are a few less hairs on my head and considerably more landscapes within it. That is the only difference. As to the principles that guide me, I shall retain the ones I have always had until further notice. Besides, if I had to say how I feel deep down, and if, and if it doesn't sound too presumptuous, I would say, too late now, I'm too old to change. When one has lived as I have a completely inner life, full of turbulent analyses and repressed enthusiasms, when one has so frequently excited and calmed oneself by turns, and employed all one's youth in learning to manage one's soul, as a horseman manages his horse, making it gallop across fields at the touch of the spur, walk, walk with short steps, jump ditches, trot and amble, all simply for his own enjoyment and to learn more about such things. Well, what I mean is if one doesn't break one's neck at the outset, the chances are one won't break it later. Um, and that's a wonderful, I mean, this is not, he, he's communicating with his mother. He's really telling her about himself in a, in a in, a, I think, a wonderful way. Um, we, I'd like, like to talk to you more about the, the, the um, his correspondence and what you feel about them and which, which relationships are the ones that, in your views, uh, bring out the best, the worst, the, the most interesting aspects of them. Just to give you some idea, there's Louise Collet and Georges Sand, Guy de Maupassant, who was his protege, uh, his niece, Caroline, um, um, Louis Boyer and, and Alfred uh, Poitva, Maxime Ducamp, we traveled with to the uh, Middle East, Turgenev, Princess Mathilde Bonaparte, his, his, he was very funny about, uh, about the high society, uh, you know, having the tirades, anti-bourgeois tirades, frequenting high society. Um, and on and on and on, of course, Baudelaire. Um, you have a letter to Baudelaire. Why don't we hear that one now, actually? Yeah, and you know, it, it's, um, th it's another aspect of, of these letters that I find so, so moving, um, is, you know, he's, he's, as we've seen, quite capable of um, going on and on about his, his, his troubles and, and the sort of adolescent um, vibe deep into his, uh, his uh, uh, later uh, decades continues. Um, and all along the way also, there's this extraordinary generosity um, and willingness to be um, completely frank with uh, writers he admires, writers he argues with, um, and 
um, writers he's inspired by, uh, and then also uh, perhaps giving different versions to different to, to others. There's a, there's a sense of deep humanity and generosity um, around the work of others. And and when I came, first came across this this letter um, that he wrote, having read uh, Les Fleurs du Mal uh, by Charles Baudelaire. Um, which I, I read before I read any Flaubert. Um, it, it, that, you know, that was another extraordinary moment for me, the, the um, en encounter with, with Les Fleurs du Mal. Um, and to, to see this, it's not, an, it's not a, a long letter, it's not sort of an extraordinary letter, but it seems to sort of embody this willingness um, to, um, to offer uh, a, attentive, careful praise, even in a, in a fairly compressed form. So I'll just, I'll read this. Um, and it's uh, sent from Croisset on July 13th, 18. 57, and I just love the immediacy of this. He's just read this new book um, by this guy who he knew as an art critic and knew otherwise, and he's done something extraordinary. And this is what he writes to, to Baudelaire. Mon cher ami, I began by devouring your volume from beginning to end like a kitchen maid pouncing on a cereal. And now for the past week I've been reading it line by line, word by word, and I must tell you that it delights and enchants me. You have found the way to rejuvenate romanticism. You resemble no one, the greatest of all virtues. Right. So these were ideals of Flaubert's that weren't being realized. Right. He's rejuvenated romanticism. Um, the originality of your style springs from the conception. Each phrase is crammed to bursting with its idea. I love your sharpness with the refinements of language which enhance it like a Damascene work on a fine blade. These are the pieces which struck me most. Sonnet uh, 17, La Beauté, for me a work of the highest quality, and then L'Ideal, La Géante, which I already knew. Um, and then he goes on uh, in to, to enumerate uh, what he found particular, to say he hasn't really said enough, and then he closes, and then of course, um, there's a certain trial um, that he feels an affinity with that, that blows up for Baudelaire um, because Madame Bovary has been dragged through the same process. So it's this extraordinary meeting of these two individuals and the volume includes Baudelaire, uh, Baudelaire responding as well. So it's, it's a wonderful moment. Um, ben, as, as a, the Proust biographer, we were saying, saying before that Proust's letters by comparison to Flaubert's are of well, you as as you said when we were chatting, not works of art. No, the the, the letters of Marcel Proust run to twenty two volumes, <laughs> and, and a lot of it is very barren reading by uh, a, a great uh, put together by an indefatigable scholar, Philip Kolb, uh, an, an American, uh, and uh, 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 he is Proust is the greatest of novelists, I think, but uh, uh, certainly very far from the greatest greatest of letter writers. The figures that come to mind when reading Flaubert's are, are not any other French figures, but, uh, but the greatest English uh, letter writers, Byron and Keats. Uh, 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 the letters of Flaubert are a, a part of his art, and I think Judith regards them as his masterpiece. I, uh, I tend to agree. Um, I, 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 I think I think they may be the greatest of his works. Uh, they are in their in their scale, in their depth, uh, in their the, the the revelations that they contain, in the way you see this character develop in the course of a lifetime, in the course of of, of forty nine years. He was ten when he wrote the first one, and he was sixty fifty nine when he died, uh, and it's. Um, it is, it is one of, if, if it's not Flaubert's greatest work, it's one of the great Bildungsromans of, uh, of the 19th century. And uh, it, it, the first modern one in a way, because it's a romantic, it's a romantic form. Um, I, I thought I would just read here. My, his, his relationship to Georges Sand is so moving, um, especially given some of the very disobliging and nasty things he says about women and uh, the way he treats Louise, who you have to, the, the great thing about his relationship with Louise Collet, though, is she, this woman who so desperately wanted fame, and she got it, because everywhere that Flaubert is invited, so is his ex-girlfriend. And uh, I just, it's one of those ironies that I think even he might have smiled at. Um, so this is um, February 6th, 1876. 
And now, cher maître, and this is in reply to your last letter, here I think is the essential difference between us. You always, in whatever you do, begin with a great leap toward heaven, and then you return to earth. You start from the a priori, from theory, from the ideal, hence your forbearing attitude toward life, your serenity, your, to use the only word for it, your greatness. I, poor wretch, remain glued to the earth as though the soles of my shoes were made of lead. Everything moves me, everything lacerates and ravages me, and I make every effort to soar. If I try to assume your way of looking at the world as a whole, I become a mere laughingstock. <clears throat> For no matter what you preach to me, I can have no temperament other than my own, nor any aesthetic other than the one that proceeds from it. You accuse me of, quote, not letting myself go naturally. But what about discipline? What about excellence? What do I do with those? I admire Monsieur de Buffon for putting on lace cuffs before sitting down to write. That bit of elegance is a symbol. And lastly, I try naively to have the widest possible sympathies. What more can be asked of anyone? Uh, so their, their, their friendship was the candor, the, the, the freedom. That what makes the letters great is their freedom. And in, in, a, in a way you could say what makes the novels great is their discipline. And if you, if you the taut wire between the fiction in the letters is just one that hums. So, um, do you, you have uh, do you have another? Have I? You have another letter. Do you have the one? The, the, I want to leave time for some questions, but I know you want to read us the Robert Penn Warren. Oh, that's wrong. This is an interesting story. Uh, Siegmuller and Robert Penn Warren were great friends, and uh, after reading Flaubert in Egypt, Robert Penn Warren was moved to write a poem called Flaubert in Egypt. I thought I would just read uh, 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 several verses of that for you. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of writing. Let me find it. On the height of Gebel Abu Sir, looking down at the cataract where the Nile flung itself to white froth on black granite, he cried out, Eureka, the name, it is Emma, and added Bovary, pronouncing the O as recorded by his companion quite short. So home and left Egypt, which was palms, black sky, red, and the river like molten steel, and the child's hand plucking his sleeve. Bakshish, and I'll get you my mother to bed. And the bath boy, he buggered this in a clinical spirit and as a tribute to the host country. And the shanker, of course, bright as a jewel on his member, and borne home like a trophy. But not to be omitted, on the river at Thebes, having long stared at the indigo mountains of sunset, he let eyes fix on the motion of three wave crests that, in unison, bowed beneath the wind and his heart burst with a solemn thanksgiving to God for the fact that he could perceive the worth of the world with such joy. Years later, death near, he remembered the palm fronds, how black against the bright sky. So that's Robert Pidmore. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions, and I would also like to ask my, my fellow panelists to add anything that we have left out that you want to say, because I, I, I overflow myself with so many feelings about Flaubert that I get carried away, so please say more. Uh, 
Just the, 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 the last thing I'll say is, and I mentioned earlier that I, I, I teach a, a Simple Heart. I do it in a course in the form and theory of the novel that runs right up to the, the 20, into the 21st century. Um, and so these are with 19, 20 year olds. Um, and it, it's extraordinary how they, they just immediately kind of get Flaubert um, and they get into it uh, and they appreciate it in, in a way that it, really strikes me. Um, I bring other things from the 19th century to, to their attention. Let's just say it isn't always quite um, uh, as, as immediate uh, 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 a passionate response. Um, so there's something about Flaubert um, and, you know, that one, one piece in particular um, uh, that, that I, I show them that, that lights, lights people up. Um, and it just makes me think the appreciation of, of Robert Penn Warren. Um, one of my early uh, encouragers was um, Samuel Beckett, who um, made no bones about um, you know, the, the, the false binary of Balzac and Flaubert, but it was very clear where he stood. Um, and as a confirmed Beckett, a reader of Samuel Beckett, um, I knew who I was going to be reading as well. That would be a nice dinner party. <laughs> Ben, do you have an, are you, okay, please ask questions. It always takes one brave person to be the first one. I know this from many, so someone has to do it. I've been reading a lot of Zola lately and, oh, I've, I've been reading a lot of Zola lately and I'm wondering um, what he said about Flaubert um, as, a, as an influence. Um, it, he, they're so different. Uh, let's see, Zola, Emil, 610 to 611. We'll find out in one minute. I, I haven't, I, I want, well, I wanted to, I don't know what um, Zola said about Flaubert, but I do know uh, Flaubert takes, at a certain juncture, it's, it's um, not, not in, in this collection, but in, in a letter to his niece, he takes um, her a little bit to task because she's been running down uh, Nana, um, and he, he uh, makes the remark that um, uh, Zola uh, is a colossus, an awkward colossus, but a colossus nonetheless. Um, I thought that was, that was, I'd like to be that. That's wonderful, thank you for remembering that. And uh, he would have been one of those unruly, passionate, uh, spontaneous um, writers who, who uh, was able to turn out extraordinary amounts of, of writing. Flaubert, uh, it, Good Week was three pages for him. And um, that was always very, heartening to me. It took me seven years to write my biography of Denison and eight to write Colette and he was somehow perched on the rafters saying, Just three pages a week, you'll get there in a few years. Then you can take another year to revise. Uh, so, yes? Uh, well, I mean, like, so that's a great comic writer. Wait, we need, we need the, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, Flaubert for me is like one of the great comic writers. Uh, I mean, how much of that do you think comes across in the letters? I didn't hear that. He's a great comic writer. How much of that yes. comes through in the letters? That's a great question. Does anybody, do you want to respond? Not uh, There's um, his bi it's very good biography by Jeffrey Wall, an Englishman. And there's a sentence from it that is always, I've used it myself for, to describe some other writers. He describes Flaubert's lucid comic anguish. And I think lucid comic anguish is the perfect description of the, of the nature of the, it's the cosmic paradoxes of human nature. It's, it's, it's irony, but it's, it's, fu it's funny, it's comedy, it's a human comedy. Uh, it's, it's in, the, the letters are, they make you laugh aloud. Uh, the, the fiction does not make you laugh aloud, uh, but the letters. Except in Bouvard and Pecoche. Well, that, right? absolutely, that is devoted Where it's to hilarious. To, devoted yeah. to to that to, to yeah. making you laugh. But yeah, I just um, want uh, to read a short passage from one of the, the letters where he's being, to me, just hilarious. And I'm not sure that he, he means to be. It's one of the letters to Louise. Um, and uh, it's it, from 1853. And again, we have the tooth thing going on. I am just back from Rouen where I went to have a tooth pulled. It was not pulled. 
My dentist urged me to wait. However, I think that very soon I shall indeed have to part with one of my dominoes. I am aging. There go the teeth. And soon I shall be quite hairless. Well, provided one keeps one's brain, that's the main thing. How annihilation stalks us. No sooner are we born than putrefaction sets in, and life is nothing but a long battle it wages against us ever more triumphantly until the end, death, when its reign becomes absolute. And it just goes on from there. There's, there's one, some, something else I want to add to that, because Bouvard et Pécuchet, Flaubert called it, it's the dictionary of received ideas. And it's a glossary of cliches that he, um, uh, at the end, um, in, it's an encyclopedia of human stupidity in novel form. And, and then at the end of Jeffrey Wall's biography, I just thought, with a few minor omissions of, in this list, that Flaubert would have bellowed with joy at this index to his biography. Flaubert, Gustave, aesthetic mysticism, alleged sadism, artistic intransigence, attitude to marriage, castration complex, celebrity and influence, chevalier de la Légion d'honneur, death, debts, dogs, fatness, hallucinations, interest in history, masturbation, modernity, pleasure taken in books, pleasure taken in traveling, realism, recitations, romanticism, sexual abstinence, sexual initiation, sexual passion, syphilis, Use of prostitutes, views on book illustrations. <laughs> More questions? Can I ask a, a, a slightly naughty question? What do you think Flaubert, with his very strong views on how to write, would have made of the writing of Proust? Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Take the mic. Thank you. What, what would um, Flaubert have made of the writing of Proust? Hmm. Well, this is all highly speculative. I, I think he would have found it uh, too much of a muchness. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my guess because of. Uh, Proust seems to me very uh, unflaubertian. Uh, he's, he's something. It's a different verbal universe, really, and uh, uh, um, you don't find sentence. You don't find Proust-like sentences anywhere in Flaubert. I don't think. So uh, I think he would have regarded Proust as a colossus, but an awkward colossus. <laughs> to adapt the phrase. He got through Balzac and he got through Zola and he loved them and I think, I think he would have read it with tremendous. He would have been seething and he would, but but admiring and seething and and marveling, and then he would have gotten to the last the last book, and then he would have gotten on his knees and said thank you. He was also a great admirer of Hugo, uh, Hugo poetry, which, is not, which has nothing to do with. Uh, his own style, it's, it's, and he was completely, uh, he thought it was, he looked at Hugo as a... As a yes, of course, Victor, Victor, Victor Hugo. Yes, exactly. The these, these he was the model for Flaubert. Yeah. This was the great model, yeah. and that, that he couldn't be, that he wanted to be, in a sense. So, I would, that's another, we'll invite him to the dinner party with Beckett. Oh, between Emma and, Lu and Louise. I'm sure there's lots of theses about this subject. He meets her, he's, he's started it, he's been thinking about it, so she's not the inspiration from it at all. Uh, he says in one of the letters that the inspiration was, first he was gonna write the story of an, a retrospective story of an old woman from the provinces who looks back on her life and then he decided that that wouldn't be juicy enough and he would he realized that if he was going to make this very in a way morally dreary uh, depressing story where everybody ends up that it had to it had to be it couldn't be the story of an old woman at the end of her life so she existed before well before louise 
Um, and I don't know. Do, do you have any idea about that? Well, only, you know, no, no, nothing particularly um, shaped to offer, but if one reads those letters to Louise, where the passions really let themselves yeah, go, um, you encounter the sort of the, the dream of Emma in a way, um, this dream for something greater and more extraordinary, and it feels like it's it's encapsulated um, in uh, in this relationship. So, whether or not he would claim this direct connection, th there's an affinity at the very least of desire, I suppose. He, I think Emma, well, he said it himself, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, he said, I'm, he, he, Emma, the, the, the passions of Emma, the, the romantic fantasies of Emma, the, um, the dream of true love, all of those things that he renounced, uh, he put into her, and he, I, I am sure he saw those in, he definitely saw those in Louise, and they probably fed the character, because she was also longing for true love, his true love. And she was disillusioned brutally. Yes. Um, how long after his death were the letters first published? And also, uh, does anyone know like how they were collected? Was it one editor who went around and got them all, or the letters? Louise Collet. Um, Louise Collet. After she died, her daughter, uh, whom she write, talks about to Flaubert all the time, and. Uh, and bringing up the daughter and supporting the daughter who was illegitimate um, was constantly on her mind. And the daughter needed money and she sold them. Now, I forget who bought them. I don't know. Maybe they went to the, eventually wound up in the, in the Bibliothèque Nationale. I don't know. Do you know about the other, how stigma, how the letters, do you know, Miriam, how the letters were collected? The, the, how, who had them, where, where the letters came from, Flaubert's letters? Um, I think it was... For all over, all yeah. Over. But Louise, uh, it's, I think, stigma um, in, in, the, in the NYRB collection, it, they said it because the family was needed money. Yeah. The, the, the children, Louise's children needed Her children, yes, they, they, her, they, her daughter, they, yeah. They took care right. of the letters, not so But the other, I think he wanted to know where all of these letters came from. Uh, I, people kept Flaubert's letters is, is, is I think, one, one reason. I have to tell you just one more personal experience. It meant the world to me. When I was doing my, my research on, on Colette in the old Bibliothèque Nationale, the one on the, the Rue de Richelieu, in the rare book room, in the manuscript room, on my last day, I'd been there for a year every day, as, you know, from nine in the morning until five at night. The curator, um, Madame Le Pavec, said to me, we became French, and she said, you can have any manuscript in my collection, this goes back to François Villon, any manuscript in the collection for the day at your desk. Without hesitation, not one second, I said, l'éducation. And then I watched her, because it's, she, she was a very petite woman, sort of my size, and she, there was a spiral staircase to where the manuscripts were kept. And she came down, they were chagrin-bound folio binders of the manuscript. Flaubert spent a fortune on paper. He, this was something he didn't skimp, skimp on. I remember opening the first one, I had cotton gloves on, opened the first pages. There in front of me, Flaubert's handwriting on his manuscript. It's all crossed out, and you turn the page. Now they all felt all crossed out. It was a battleground. And, uh, and, and at some point, I just, I wanted to shake him and I said, it's beautiful, you can go on, this is good, just keep, keep going. Uh, so, uh, there's a huge manuscript collection there, but that's a very interesting question. Which is not not the sense that you get with the letters, except you know that that seems to be one of the great differences is that um, the 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 battle seems to be being waged elsewhere in a sense, right? Yes, um, absolutely. And and the letters are a space for something else. So you don't hear him writing about you know I've I've tried I've started this fifteen times and finally no he just goes and and you you get this um, this gesture um, that feels um, unworked and yet it's he spent his whole life working to write these things in a way. Um, and, and so it's, it's a, a beautiful contrast. It is a wonderful contrast. Um, to whom does he write, live like a bourgeois, think like a demigod? Oh. Is that to Louise? Sounds like something he would have said to her. To her. Yes. yes. Um, 
I, I've, taken that, mode I've taken that as my motto. Yes. Yeah. It must have been to her. He wouldn't have, you know, also because he indulged in a little grandiosity with her that he wouldn't have maybe dared with other, with other correspondents. Certainly not with Turgenev. No, not, he, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have mentioned the word demigod to Turgenev or to Georges Saint, or to, but he could say demigod to her. I and think his, it his, must be. His mentorship of, of Maupassant yeah. is a different kind of mentorship. He's, he's older, it's later in life, it's not, Maupassant is not his one-time lover or, or current lover, um, uh, and, and he, he treats it differently. But he might have said something like that. Um, Perhaps not quite so grandiose. I think that's the difference with Mopassant. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I've heard different versions of it. We are going to go back now and look it up and find out. Live like a bourgeois, so you can write like a... It, the word demigod, it, I remember it differently, but I, my memory is lucky I can remember um, what I have to do tomorrow. Thank you for... Is there another question? One more. We have time for one more question. Uh, you can you can buy Flaubert's correspondence and and uh, Ben's wonderful biography and Laird's wonderful novel and, and exactly. my essays are out there uh, uh, outside and thank you so much for coming you a great audience I felt thank, thank you. you.